Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sean Keller with Local Futures. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to make sure that you can all hear me okay. If you can hear me, please send a message saying so using the chat box in the upper right corner of the screen. Great, it looks like at least most of you can hear me just fine. Uh, if at any point you can't hear me, either I or my colleague Victoria will be available to help. You can ask for our help by submitting a note in the chat box. And please also feel free to let us know if a presenter's volume needs to be increased or decreased. OK, let's get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the second webinar in our Global to Local series, hosted by Local Futures Director Helena Norberg Hodge. The topic of today's webinar is climate change or system change, pathways beyond Paris. And joining Helena to discuss this topic is climate researcher and activist Camilla Moreno. Uh, Camilla is a researcher at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro and a working member of the Latin American Council of Social Sciences and the Network for a GMO-Free Latin America. Um, her recent focus has been on the territorial impacts of development policies and green economy schemes such as carbon. She will be launching a new book titled Carbon Metrics and the New Colonial Equations in Brazil in mid-2016. And she has followed international climate negotiations closely since 2008 and took part in the COP21 summit in Paris in December. So we will start with a roughly 40-minute conversation between Helena and Camilla, covering a range of topics related to climate change. And after this initial discussion, we'll open up for a question and answer period. We will officially end after an hour and a half, but we can go over by a few minutes or if there are any questions remaining. Uh, please type any questions you have at any time into the chat box. And we'll do our best to get through as many as possible during the Q&A. One final note, if your internet connection is weak, you can also call in and listen to the webinar by phone. The phone numbers and instructions on how to do this are included in your registration confirmation email, or you can simply click the info button just above the chat box. And with that, I'm going to enable the audio and video for our presenters and turn things over to Helena. Hello. Sure. Hello, Helena. Yeah, thank it you. Look, yeah, yes. It looks like your audio and video are on. Can you just confirm that it's working? Yes, it's working. Can you hear me? Yes. And Camilla, are your audio and video working as well? Yes. yes. Perfect. And All right, you can take it from here. Thank you so much, Sean. And thanks to everybody who's listening. And thank you, Camilla. I hope you're still there. I now see, yeah. Camilla, can you hear me? Thank you so much for joining yes. us. Yeah. And we're so happy to have you with us because you are someone who's been following the climate negotiations now for eight years. You were in Paris, and we wanted the scoop from you, from someone who's been following this so closely for so many years. OK, so I start? Yes, you start, please. Tell us okay. what, you, what do you see coming, you know, essentially what happened in Paris. Yes, first I'd like to thank you all for this invitation. And uh, this is my first webinar, so let's see how we work through the technology. So first I want to show you the Paris Agreement. This is the Paris Agreement. <laughs> I have it here. Uh, and I, I recommend people to download uh, at UNFCCC and try to look through the pages. You know, there is a lot of jargon. 
but I want to comment some points to help you understand this very important historical document. You know? We have civil society cheering uh, and clapping and celebrating this agreement. Uh, and from the point of view of the people that are really committed to, to fight globalization, to social justice, this agreement actually set us in a very backward uh, process. Why? Because, in fact, it has crystallized a pattern, a pattern that has been on, on the road since 1992. No, it's not an agreement that fell off the sky. It has, it, it, it's a process, it's very important to understand. We had this uh, moment that it's not a part of the negotiations, but set the tone, which happened in 2006 with the launching of the STEM report, the economics of climate change. From 2006 to now, 2015, just about a decade, we have been witnessing within the climate negotiations uh, the use of the climate change problem as a vehicle to bring more globalization, more development, and of course, more trade and more financial markets. Uh, this document is historical because as a, a French uh, President Francois Hollande, he said at the closing plenary, now uh, we have entered the uh, low carbon era. This means that any kind of economic reasoning we do from now on. Are you, can you hear me? I cannot see you, but it's tied from now on to this idea of carbon as a unity. Why this is important? Because the entire agreement is built upon this idea of net impact. When I talk about the net effects or the net impacts, I am not referring to effective, local, really concrete action on climate change. What I'm referring to, and this is what the agreement puts forward, is a global dynamics of offsetting. Is a global dynamics of looking places um, in the planet where it's cheap to provide the carbon emission reduction. So this is very, uh, has, has shown itself to be very damaging to local communities. Uh, we have more than one decade of documented impacts of carbon trading in local projects. I change to Helena because I think she wants to add some things now. <laughs> well, I, I would like to add that in terms of the general public, uh, as we see it, one of the biggest problems was the way that Al Gore framed the issue. You know, Al Gore was credited as bringing this very important, very alarming mm -hmm. message to the world. And unfortunately, so many environmentalists, the majority, I would say, and the majority of the general public were very grateful that this important, powerful man was to get this very important message into the media. And they uncritically accepted his message and his analysis. And of course, it was a good thing to get people concerned about climate change. But what people were not paying attention to was the framing essentially focused only on consumption, on consumers, on domestic use in the Western world. And the message was, this is an enormous problem. The world is coming to an end. We've got to do something. And you, you individual, in your domestic use, Stop driving the car, don't go on holiday, and buy new light bulbs. Intuitively, people have known that that isn't really going to change things. And this is why, you know, we, it's so tragic now that people are saying, oh, what's wrong with people? 
They haven't saved the world by changing their light bulbs, don't act, they're not changing things. We must realize that people don't learn from information. Uh, we have to try to reach them at a more psychological, a deeper level. In the meanwhile, the actual change in the economic systems of production and consumption the way that corporations have had more and more influencing, pushing more and more consumerism into every corner of the globe, including adverts in the year. In the meanwhile, the most important thing is that industrial production has shifted into the hands of giant multinational corporations who will now produce virtually every single shirt on three continents, who will transport things back and forth, literally the same products being imported and exported from uh, the same country. So the U.S. will export as much beef as it imports annually. The U.K. will export as much butter and milk as it imports annually, roughly the same quantities. And you have things like apples flown to South Africa to be washed from the UK, flown back again. Um, you have the, uh, you have literally from Norway, from many countries in Europe, fish being flown to China just to be deboned and flown back again. Now that picture, unfortunately, we're not hearing in the environmental movement, and the entire argument, as Camilla is saying has shifted into the hands of global corporations who have come up with these marvelous tools of reducing everything to carbon, an easily traded commodity. They are the ones who have the trillions, now quadrillions of dollars, pushing them into large-scale monocultural production large-scale massive increases in consumerism and for them this has been a very convenient and tragic for us a tragic change so it is vital that we listen to Camilla we listen to the people who have actually joined these negotiations and who are aware that what's happening at the level of the UN and at the le level of these government negotiations is actually about power. And we're talking about this systemic interlinking between large banks and large corporations like Monsanto, like Walmart. We have almost like a machine now pushing this commercial, commodifying, and very, very destructive system. But there is hope because from the grassroots, Everywhere you will see people doing things differently and you will find in the global south that there are still a lot of people who have not been caught up in this system. We absolutely do not want to leave you feeling despair and, and uh, uh, losing hope. We actually believe that with this clearer, more holistic, global understanding, we could help create a movement very rapidly that could be, that could lead to fundamental systemic change. So I hope um, that you will help to spread the word and let's hear more from Camilla about mm -hmm. the actual agreements, how you see what's happening. Well, so back to the first uh, main point is to understand that this netify, as I call it, the idea that we can have net effects it's fundamentally false because ecosystems cannot be liquefied and I cannot uh, remedy the, the damage I'm doing here in South America elsewhere. So uh, this whole idea of net uh, challenges the very core of the localized logic that things have to be dealt on the territories, on the landscape with the people that live there. Uh, so the second main point that this agreement brings to us 
is uh, what is called a new mechanism to operationalize how the corporations and international capital are playing around with the so-called uh, uh, climate action just to move forward their own agendas. So uh, before we had the clean development mechanism that it was how through uh, the Kyoto Protocol carbon trading was inserted in the in the climate negotiations and the operationalization of the convention. Now we have a new uh, um, mechanism called sustainable development mechanism where countries can, uh, for example, Germany or UK, instead of promoting climate action in their own countries, uh, they can buy certificates they can buy internationally transferable mitigation units from elsewhere, from any other country in the world that is willing to um, produce this kind of projects and to generate those so-called internationally transferable mitigation units. Before, this was possible to be done only between North and South countries on Annex 1 and the Annex 2. Now it can be done among any countries. For example, the Eastern European countries that are on the margins of the European Union are actually competing now to bring their lands as Poland, as Hungary, just to produce biofuels and biomass to supply to the so-called now green heating uh, in the more central and more rich countries of the uh, European Union. Another very important dispositive of this agreement is the so-called INDCs, internationally, nationally determined, um, inter nationally determined, it's uh, confusing the acronyms in Portuguese and in English, but the contributions that each country has committed before the agreement, what they are going to do to reach the emission reduction. This is important to understand because although it is uh, voluntary, um, what it sets forth is that countries uh, have, uh, let me turn my mic a little bit down, is it better now the sound? I hope so. Uh, so the countries can design better. scenarios, they can model um, what the uh, what their business as usual, usual trajectory would be, and then they can offer in the international scenario uh, as business opportunities for those who want to pay and to finance for their public policies. This has uh, created, for example in Africa, especially for African countries, this uh, gold rush of consultants that have designed it, you know, how those countries can now compete among them for attracting agribusiness. We know that there are big interests around the so-called climate art agriculture that is a completely GMO, highly chemical-based agriculture. We know that there are a lot of enterprises that are promoting uh, renewable, so-called renewable energy, but of course it's not a renewable energy as we understand that is locally owned and it's for the profit of the people. It's a renewable energy that is in the hands of mega, giga, international, transnational conglomerates that are wanting for this market. So, uh, I think I can, I don't know, uh, Elena, if you want to jump in and add something. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll just and I think maybe you can turn your mic down a little bit more, I think. I can okay. hear you, but maybe you can turn your mic down a little bit more. Yeah. Is it better? So now? I think, again, what we're looking at is how the climate issue has increased the power of global corporations and banks, how it has increased, yes, things seeing worldwide is that there has been a very, very effective use of the climate issue 
as a way of imposing unsustainable development, not just in the south, but even in the industrialized world, have to look out for the fact that what's being promoted when it comes to solutions that go beyond individuals changing their light bulbs, the renewable energy package is very large scale, centralized systems that are fitting right into the current global growth economy. And as Camilla was saying, that means that it is about profit for global corporations. And in being that, it is at this time fundamentally destructive of both jobs and the environment in local economies, in national economies, in regions all around the world. So we really need uh, to questioning this analysis. We are in no way questioning the seriousness of climate change. We are not questioning the need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, which by the way, Camilla will also probably mention that the fossil fuels have been eradicated from the language. This is a very effective way of, of maintaining these myths about the problem and how to solve it. So I think the, the key message about what we're saying is that climate change is an extremely serious and important issue, but it's been framed from the very beginning in a way that is counterproductive and that has actually contributed to destructive growth and development worldwide. And what is so destructive about that growth is that it's systematically destroying meaningful livelihood, destroying farmers worldwide. What we know as farming is being eradicated. It's being replaced by corporate industrial production using large scale machinery using genetic engineering, using uh, technology at every level. So we're talking about replacing people and, and human scale structures with energy intensive technology at every turn. And this is why we are worried about technology at every turn. And we are leaving millions of people now, most of them in crowded cities without any chance of a livelihood, of a way of supporting themselves. So we're dealing with very serious crisis. It is a win-win solution. Uh, and this systemic path uh, is something the world, you know, is ready for, is waiting for, because most people are aware that we need fundamental systemic change. And that's what we're talking about. And we over to again. OK. So as uh, Helena has just said, much more than numbers. Sometimes we get too obsessed with numbers. We need to understand the logics behind and the dynamics. Uh, for for example, again in the agreement, now I think people have shared the link to the English text. No, um, the first part is the is not the agreement, is the COP decisions where they mention the intended nationally determined contributions. And what the agreement recognizes is that the pool uh, of the efforts of all the countries, what everybody has committed to do uh, to by 2020, it does not match the reduction of emission necessary to keep the world in just a two degrees warming scenario. So what is written here in the agreement is that uh, recognizing this, that it, 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 this aggregate sum does not fall within least cost two degrees scenarios. You know that the devil lies on the details, no? And this short two words, least cost, they should bring red lights to you. Because we're not talking about a science calculating just the temperature trend. We are talking here about science already calculating 
the appliance of technological packages, the best technology that is available. And this is why when countries as Germany, now I'm repeating Germany, but there are many others, were cheering the 1.5 degree alternative that is also included here. This means, okay, you want to run into a path of only 1.5 degree scenarios, we can do it. But then you have to accept the most extreme technology. We're talking here about geoengineering. We're talking about negative emission technology as carbon capture and storage, which is unproven. So this whole debate about building capacity in countries, creating, again, jargon of the negotiators, enabling environments, it's about how they are going to transfer technology from the north to the south. They are going to charge patents and this to buy and to use the license for these technologies. We are talking about creating new forms of debt. This is very important to understand. If you are really seriously on addressing climate change from a holistic perspective, from a deep ecological understanding of the interdependence of all the cycles in nature, not only the carbon cycle, but all the cycles, uh, we have to bring again back to the center of the stage local knowledge, traditional indigenous people knowledge. It's not only Western science that is coupled with a technological package that will so solve us. And what we, in fact, what we are allowing with this agreement is that any other knowledge that does not fit into the least cost options are excluded from the realm of public policy. And for me, this is very serious because we are just excluding from the landscape, from our political options, what uh, could be saving us and could be really moving us back to localized solutions. Well, I think um, that one of the uh, key elements here is the entire development, the worldview of development. And, and as we've seen now with the Paris Agreement, we have an escalation in corporate domination and above all, intellectual domination. At the same time, the new UN Sustainable Development Goals are taking us again intellectually a giant step in the same direction that the climate agreements are based on. And the direction is, we must remember, is the power of global, mobile, deregulated finance and corporate activity. While we have talk about climate in Paris and we have new very green sounding sustainable development goals, which again, much of the idealistic activist community have celebrated and supported. While that's going on, at the same time, we have a series of trade treaties that are committing governments, committing them in black and white to allow corporations, multinational corporations, to sue them if they do anything to protect the environment, protect the potential profit. We are actually economically allowing the world to move into the hands, you know, to basically deliver the, the earth and its people on a silver platter to global for-profit corporations. Now, this has become a system that we really should understand system is how money is created, who creates it, who controls how much money is circulated in economies, how that money 
it is not only circulated, but who gets to use it and who doesn't get to use it. This is being handed over to global banks and financial instruments. These financial instruments are essentially getting their marching orders now from robots. Every day the trade in the market is essentially being determined by computerized algorithms and robots. So I think it's very helpful to understand that uh, really what we're facing is handing over our world, our lives, the price of our water, our democracies, supposed to democracies, into a money-making machine. Now this deregulation that allows such them has come through three trade treaties, freedom for global cooperation. And we are seeing in our experience internationally is that most politicians who go along with it have no understanding of what's happening. Just as activists at the grassroots graced an Al Gore framing of climate, in the same way politicians and activists have embraced the entire economic system they have ignored the deregulation of trade until very recently. Uh, so we're, we, are, we are feeling in our work, in local futures work, we are feeling optimistic now because we've been trying to save these things now for almost four decades with our fundamental critique of this development model and the trade treaty. The technologization of life, the energy intensity that destroys real and meaningful livelihood. So we we are um, growth in awareness of the trade treaties, and we're also seeing a broad-based grassroots movement that we describe as a localization movement because it's about rebuilding the connections, the connections between people, between production and consumption into human scale chains of connection and support. It's actually the only way we can create a market that is resistant to the global market. And it is happening worldwide. It's happening particularly around food. Within many economies, that food will still be more expensive than it should be because the price of labor, the pressures within local economies are so great. But the local food movement, the local business alliance, the attempt to build up decentralized renewable energy systems there are attempts all around the world, you know, even in China, in Japan, across the world. Um, these structures, these initiatives, these local projects that are more here and that build and adapt economic activity to the diversity of life. Life is diversity. We have single moment of our lives we are in a process of diversity and change. Process and, and infinite diversity. Every single leaf, every single worm, every single cell in our bodies is unique and different from every other one. And it changes from moment to moment. In order to develop economic structures that can respect that process and that diversity, that can respect this principle of life, we must reduce the scale of economic uh, systems and entities. We need multiple smaller businesses to provide all our basic needs. Uh, so. I think the localization movement, which can be promoted through big picture activism, is the way forward. Remember that your activism now is about raising awareness. It's about letting people hear about the deep 
and detailed analysis that people like Camilla have and getting the word out the need for a systems change. Camilla. Uh, yes, I agree with Helena that... Uh, I, I'm thinking, yeah. It's my I microphone. We get to also discuss how this development part is. Yes, it, it is. Can you hear me? Yes, now. It's too loud. Go ahead, Camilla. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I agree with Helena that uh, uh, the optimism and the hope is within the grassroots and the movements. But uh, the hope and the renewal is not coming from the United Nations. Now, this is, this is important to understand that actually they are part of the hegemonic discourse. Within the, uh, the so-called now uh, low-carbon development, it's how they are rebooting the development discourse that we have been fighting and seeing uh, the effects you know, for the last decades. Uh, now there is a strong push for mega urbanization. We will have a big conference, Habitat 3, uh, in October in Ecuador, and it's presented massive agglomerations of people, especially in Southeast Asia. And we're talking here about cities at least 10 million people are, again, the most cost-effective landscapes for to operationalize the technologies that can uh, make everything connected to big data and can make everything automatic and then can, be, can make citizens uh, within this carbon economy to offset and to move and to generate carbon credits every move they make. For example, if I decided to take, uh, I'm using this Apple Watch, and if I decided to take a bike and not ride a car, which is fine, which we all agree, just this decision will generate carbon credits because you decided not to take the car, and those carbon credits can be bought, for example, by a cement industry of France, from France to offset their emissions and continue to pollution. So this kind of a crazy logic where everything is being weaven into the financial system that of course is much more easily applicable, uh, applicable no, in large urban landscapes. What they are not climate change uh, strategies is that people want to stay living in the rural areas. That maybe we need to shorten circuits of commercialization, as Helena uh, was speaking before, that we need to deglobalize trade and that we need maybe, yes, to discuss how to deurbanize. We have built cities that are not human landscapes. There is no more place to interact among, among us, among humans. There is no more place to interact us humans with nature. We are living in cement jungles that can be very suitable as consumers, but they will not actually open the cognitive and the experimental landscape for us to change our relationships with nature, for us to live a much more simpler life without the consumerism and without everything that is being imposed on us. So I think there is a big agenda forward. There is a lot of important discussions to take place now in this Beyond Paris landscape. And I'm really looking forward for everything that Isaac is promoting and, you know, with the guiding presence of Helena Good. It's a really pleasure to be here. Oh, well, we, we are... Um, Hello? We have another couple of minutes. Do you want to say more yeah. about what you think people can do? What do you okay. think is the most important? People who are listening, what do we want them to do when they've finished listening to the webinar? Well, I, 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 I think first thing is to understand that if we have been fighting this idea of offsetting, you know, now we need to fight much harder because now the scheme has, getting, has gotten global. Then the second point is that uh, corporations as Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, they were 
presented in Paris as the ones with infrastructure scale, they call it. Because if you reduce all the environmental crisis, environmental big crisis we are living in, to carbon, of course they are the ones most suitable uh, as Google to you know to monitor, to verify, and to account for carbon. What people sometimes don't understand is the initiative. We are discussing there in Paris satellites, uh, early warning systems. They can look very nice. They can look like okay, we want to forecast. Asked. Uh, except as citizens, this massive infrastructure of control provide with information for this entire system. I don't know if you're hearing me because I lost your uh, your video, but I think those are the issues that are crucial crucial because they impact society at large. They are defining a new moment in history where our conceptions of privacy, for example, will not exist anymore. You know, this we have been seeing with Snowden and all those recent episodes. But now, under the cover of fighting climate change, those things are get, going to get much, much worse. And it's important that, that those difficult debates, because it's not easy to unpack, that they, they can be discussed, you know, within uh, civil society. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Helena and Camilla, for a wonderful discussion. It's now time for a question and answer period. If you have a question you'd like to pose to Helena or Camilla, please type it into the chat box in the upper right corner of the screen. And uh, while we wait, I don't know, Helena and Camilla, if you want to say anything else. Well, there's lots to say, isn't there, Camilla? <laughs> Are there a few, few thoughts? I think maybe, Camilla, since you've been studying agriculture also for so long, it'd be good if you can say something about what's happening to agriculture. Again, uh, okay, I'm going to. This corporate system. Oh. Okay, I'm going to show something here, the landscape approach for sustainability in African agribusiness. Uh, it's important to see that the corporate world has captured a lot of our languages. You know? We are seeing even Cargill and Monsanto talking about agroecology. They are refined in a way that they co-opt our languages. So now the landscape approach that we could think, oh, that's very good because this is holistic. This is being used by Unilever, by Danone, because they see that now is their role to integrate everybody in the global value chains that they rule. So uh, the main plan is, of course, to evict people and to introduce heavy mechanized agriculture. But for many, many cultures, you actually cannot mechanize. You have the fine fruits. I mean, you have a lot of New Zealand agriculture. Uh, we have all the um, uh, like salads and tomatoes and things with uh, um, high uh, aggregated value, for example, in the urban centers. That need to use uh, human labor. And for this, what they are presenting as the idea is that they will have drones, you know, supervising the crops. They will have a package. Think of the extreme green revolution, because they will have a seed that, accordingly to them, is GMO. It's draw resistant, and that the young farmer in Africa or in South America will receive a smartphone, and with this smartphone, it will be guided on what time to plant, how much agrochemicals to put in, when to harvest, and this is being sold as the emancipation for the youth that want to remain in the rural areas. But uh, if we talk uh, with people that you know follow up, uh, what is the social dynamics 
in the field we what we are doing is creating people that have no more knowledge no more autonomy on their traditions uh, specific agriculture because they need to be transformed into agri business and so this is the fundamental shift that they are operating through technology is to disconnect people from the land even if they are living on the land but they don't have more any knowledge about when to plant they cannot read the wind regime they don't understand the rain patterns they cannot read the signs that are written all over nature and i think this for me it's very perverse because we are using the vast of technology just to homogenize, to standardize, to expand more and more monocultures. People need to be aware of this strategy. And I think, again, it's so important that we realize that there are these counter movements. And one of them, perhaps one of the most important things we need to rethink when it comes to this bigger picture is that small-scale diversified farms with a lot of diversity including animals in the cycle can mm -hmm. actually produce vastly more per unit of land and water than big monocultures so this is the fundament of rethinking a different path a different economic path understanding diversity is a fact of life to the extent we destroy it, we're destroying life. And we're destroying our potential really to survive. If we continue on this path, where are we heading? So diversity is a fundament. Diversified small farms with more labor, with more people on it, can produce vastly more per unit of land than large monocultures. Environmentalists. Um, but we, we feel again that with the big picture and understand this fundamental shift, not so complex as it may sound, there are a few basic principles that are at play here that can help people understand why they must support a path towards more localized, adapted systems. And remember again that the myth that we need large farms large supermarkets to feed the world. That's been the myth that to a great extent lies behind the incredibly destructive development path we're seeing. Please also keep in mind that not only is there an idea of a different system, different systems are actually being implemented at the grassroots. There's a whole array of what we call the local food movement that includes real agroecology, that includes permaculture, that includes biodynamic farming, that includes genuinely organic and sustainable production. They're demonstrating that we can, with the same farming structures, increase productivity, increase the number of jobs, and increase the joy of feeling connected to other people and to nature. So we're really talking about a, a, an enormous win-win-win strategy. And not only is it a theory, it's happening. One of the biggest problems we have is that the, the knowledge, the news about what's going on around the world that is genuinely positive is not getting out. What is getting out is the massive propaganda using more and more green language, as Camilla was saying, it is, it's really frightening to see how much the language has changed at the level of corporate and government, uh, monocultural, consumer-oriented, destructive development. So I hope we have some questions now. We do. We have a yeah. number of excellent questions already. Um, You've gone some way towards answering one that several people were asking, which is what actions must be taken at state, regional, national, international levels? What, what do you recommend we do now? Um, someone asked, what about a worldwide carbon tax? Do you want to speak more about that? 
Uh, yeah, this is complicated because this is the business agenda, you know. Uh, we have this, I mean, this is kind of an older publication. The future is priceless. Put a price, let's see here, put a price on carbon, no? And this is, this is uh, embodied in the largest oil corporations. Also, they have signed it in the mid-2015, uh, this kind of document, because for them, and people need to understand that, you know, to tax carbon, uh, depending on the price, it's good for them too, because, you know, uh, it, this is all used in changing the infrastructure, and we're not talking about phasing out fossil fuel, but fossil fuels, but for example, transiting from coal to natural gas. In the scale of the emissions, natural gas is seen as a more advanced fuel. And so, for example, Total, the big oil company, is really pushing forward this shell, has a 100 years now uh, on gas strategy. So we have to understand that sometimes the idea can sound good, but it's being pushed forward, for example, by WTO. And uh, OECD countries also uh, were discussing that, okay, if countries from the south, Brazil, China, do not want to implement a strong environmental policy, what they can do is when they import goods that are produced in the south to northern markets, they can verify the carbon content of those commodities and they can charge a plus or make a carbon tax border adjustment. And this is on the interest of, for example, selling environmental goods and services that we know are not environmental, neither good, but they can fall uh, within the new categories that the very same industry and the very same corporate actors are shaping. They are defining the standards to what is renewable electricity, for example, and uh, how I can access regional markets. This is important, for example, in European context. But I've seen that you also, somebody asked, I can refer after the end of this uh, webinar, a list of publications that may be of interest for people who want to dig further on this. But we have also a question about peak oil, if it was, uh, in any way referred to in the agreement. Uh, those COPs, those negotiations are very strange settings. It's like uh, the Alice in the wonder Wonderland, where people apparently have drunk in something, have drunk something, because nobody speaks about oil, coal, gas, fracking, nothing. It's like they speak on a vacuum this very specific language of reducing the world into emissions is a way of avoiding. They don't talk, they close their eyes, they don't talk about the most important thing. And this is why in all the pages of the agreement, there is zero reference to fossil fuels. Zero. And this is important to check. Uh, I think I also see here a question about how to fight for our own language. And this, it's, uh, uh, Helena was referring to, this is key. This is very important. Because imagine if they steal permaculture from us. Permaculture is a result of struggles and is a worldwide movement. If we now have corporations taking the term and redefining what is permaculture for them, it's going to be more and more difficult for us to explain that our permaculture is not their permaculture. So this is something that is an ongoing struggle for us to keep on the fight for what is our vocabulary. And some question here about the natural step. I think this pretty much looks like this combination of a Fortune 500 companies with local communities. I find, I don't know much, but I find it kind of strange. I, I, um, I also know about the natural step and uh, have been very disappointed because it was started by a Swede, someone I know, and he refused to discuss the trade treaties that were so clearly taking the whole world in the wrong direction. And, and this, by the way, is what we have found, is that there's a, there's a way in which the global media, which of course, again, is corporate, 
has completely silenced the critique of the trade treaties. And I would argue that if you look at almost any environmental initiative now that does not address the trade treaties, you have to be suspicious. Uh, you have to be uh, aware that it absolutely doesn't make sense to be looking at how we can protect the natural world if we allow our governments to simultaneously be signing away their rights to protect the environment. If they're signing documents that make it illegal for them to do anything that would reduce the profit of, of global corporations and banks. I mean, it, it's just an, an insanity. And of course, it means that we, we don't have any real democracy. So I think the, the frightening thing is the way in which so many well-intentioned environmentalists have actually fallen prey to the very, very sophisticated language that has been developed over these last three decades. And uh, it's, I think, important to mention here that many of the people who helped to develop the language within, for instance, the UN bodies of sustainability, of cultural diversity and protection, of democracy, of all the things we all care about, many of the people who are developing that language actually believe that they are helping to bring that positive change to the world. It is only with a really big picture, connected analysis, where we actually look at what's happened to the economic system, where we actually look at this process of trade treaties, that we can see that it's, it's a complete joke, that actually as agents of generating growth in GDP, GDP, which cannot provide in any way an accurate measure of increasing real human and ecological well-being. Using that indicator it is also a joke. So we're really looking at a fundamental rethink of the economy. It's beginning to happen. I want to stress that again. So what can we do? Number one, we can inform ourselves much more thoroughly and remember holistically of what's going on. Don't ever look at any issue without examining its social as well as environmental impact and never ignore the economic dimension of that social and ecological change. So both in terms of the negative and the positive. We can inform ourselves not only in a holistic way of the destructive dominant system and the dominant discourse, the hegemonic discourse, as Camilla describes it, we can also inform ourselves of the positive, smaller scale, silent movements that are happening all around us. I myself, as a proponent of localization, have been amazed. I've been amazed at how much more is happening than I have been aware of. I will go in and out of different countries promoting localization, and I'll come back a year or two later and be astounded at how much is happening. We must, we owe it to ourselves to become more informed also about the positive changes that are happening. We mustn't, by doing that, think that we should only devote ourselves to that local development and the local analysis. We have to be very careful because I see that happening quite often. People discover the benefits of localization and immerse themselves in that process at the local level. This is not enough. We have, at the same time, the dominant system continue to escalate. We will not be able to arrive at a healthier, happier world where human and ecological well-being are the goal. If we allow the corporate juggernaut to continue to be supported by our representatives, our governments that claim to represent us. So we must practice what we call both resistance and renewal, resisting the continued expansion with a first goal is to hold 
further trade and finance deregulation. So please read up on the TPP, on the TTIP, on other treaties that are being negotiated as we speak to further commercialize life, to further hand over power to unaccountable, invisible banks and corporations. Uh, so in terms of action at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level, look at both resistance and renewal within those fora. At the most local level, your personal life, one of the key steps is to ensure your well-being, your strength, and that involves personal transformation. That transformation means connecting more deeply to other people, making it a practice to reach out. We are not aware of just how much we suffer from the isolation and competition that the dominant consumer culture imposes on us. We don't realize how we often buy into ideas that separate us further, that generate more fear of being vulnerable, of being imperfect, of being known for who we really are. None of us are perfect. None of us are, are, are in any way, in any way, able to live up to the artificial stereotypes that are implanted on our minds, and particularly on the minds of our children, all part of this commercial system that create in children the sense that they are not good enough unless they can look like and own all the goodies, the wealth and the power that are romanticized in the global media. So here we're talking about the psychological transformation that we need to encourage in ourselves and our children to regain a real sense of healthy self-esteem and healthy work. And that happens through connection, deeper connection to other people, deeper connection to nature. Help our children experience the wonder of life, planting a few seeds, even if you live in the city, uh, and, and experiencing the joy of being a participant and a part of the natural world. Help your children go into nature, not just to compete in some football game, but to actually quiet the mind and experience the sense of joy and wonder at being part of this amazing, beautiful planet where there is still so much joy and beauty. We mustn't forget that part of what we need to do, but we can't allow ourselves to dwell there. We cannot stay in a bubble of enjoying and celebrating that richness of life because that richness of life is threatened as we speak. So we have to practice this difficult uh, way of moving in and out of these two realities. And they are realities, both sides. I better stop and let Camilla speak a bit. I've been going on a bit too have long. A, I have a question for Camilla, actually. Um, question is, was there a mention mm -hmm. of peak oil at COP21? Is there a country or organization who's participated in the talks and raised this issue? No. Nobody speaks about peak oil. In fact, um, it's interesting, you know, again, because I saw that somebody saying that there is a difference between a fee, a dividend, a tax, or carbon trading. I have written with other colleagues a piece on a critique we do uh, um, from carbon metrics, you know, from the idea of accepting carbon as a basic unity of our economic thinking. This is now here to stay. Uh, the Paris Agreement has crystallized a pattern. You know, we we end up working with global abstractions that we forget they have history. The metric system was invented once upon a time and was imposed everywhere in the world by France uh, because it was helpful to foster global trade. The GDP was invented after the Second World War because it was suitable to define what was going to be the third world, the underdeveloped poor, 
and what was going to be the countries tagged or named rich countries. And then you have to make up a way to artificially account of who is poor and who is rich. You can have a very complex and non-market-based web of social relations and connections with the environment that you have a house, you have access to all natural resources, we have diverse and local food, but under World Bank standards, you are rated poor because the idea is how we are going to include those peoples as wage laborers, as earners of salaries, and not more as subsistence or self-sustaining people. But this is a discussion that goes way beyond what we are talking here. I wanted to call the attention is that for the World Bank and uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, IMF officials, they are saying constantly that carbon needs to be the currency of the 21st century. We had the gold standard and the gold standard that you know organized the economy within the Bretton Woods um, era you know, was abandoned unilaterally by United States in the early 70s. Since then, we have seen this escalating process of financialization of the economy because it, it's simply just printing money with no ballast, with nothing that sustain a completely uh, global casino of emitting money. This uh, has generated an economic crisis. We just saw this in 2008, the bubbles, you know, the financial bubbles, the housing bubbles. And uh, from the very core of the habitats of the system, they feel a need to ground, to anchor the economy for the century. So it doesn't matter how you address it, if you call it fee, dividend, tax, or cap and trade. We have what they need is that countries accept as the entry point that carbon is an international unit that can have an international price. Of course, a price that is determined in dollars or in euros. So um, again, on the big picture analysis that Helena was referring, somebody wrote here about the need to be transparent. This transparency, again, is quite tricky because it's transparent once you run in your government's computer some Microsoft program, program that they consider is it's, uh, certified. It's transparent when you, you run to decide what kind of policy you are going to implement on your country when you run accepted models that are designed and the algorithms are locked somewhere in some northern country. This is uh, the big rule of the big data can be very tricky. We are not talking something built from bottom up. We are talking on people accepting the surveillance scheme that I was referring to. And that is very clear in countries that have uh, rainforest, for example, that have to be, uh, have to accept to be surveilled constantly because, you know, they may burn uh, the carbon that belongs now to somewhere else. Uh, I want to take a reference here to something that I personally find very important on the sense of the strategies that we need, uh, what to do on the, on the local ground, you know. Um, I, I don't see um, our reconnection with nature our very deep fundamental shift being done on the basis of a rational process only. Because rationality can be very utilitarian. And uh, it's kind of a taboo for the left and for the progressive movements to talk about the sacred. But I truly believe that there is a sacred dimension, a very deep existential reconnection with nature that needs to happen. And this is not in terms of calculating half degree or accounting units of carbon. It's something deeply spiritual. And if we don't bring this as a legitimate debate of international civil society, we are kind of departing from a point of view 
that is completely rationalistic. And this is the rationalistic modernity that has destroyed the entire world and colonized many cultures. So I truly advocate that we need a new reconnection and to bring forward a spiritual dimension and the sacred. This is not, I'm not advocating for any religious faith here. I'm just saying that the people that are the closest to nature currently, indigenous people that are living in the outskirts of this crazy world, they run on a sacred basis. They are not accounting, they are not projecting models. They don't need to be convinced by rational arguments, you know. They have a different access to what needs to be done to this ethical and moral dimension. And I think this is a fundamental uh, point that we need to bring to our uh, discussions. Uh, Camilla, again, maybe you can turn your mic down a little bit. Okay, I can't. Is that mic doesn't? Okay, is it? It's lower now. Is it better? Maybe is it better it's, now? Uh, I think a little lower still. Try again. More. Speak again. Still quite low. More. Yeah, more. Thank God. Wow. Okay, now. I think even more. Maybe it's not going down. It doesn't sound like it's gone down. Try a little more. Yeah, I think it's almost off. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, well, we really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We have a time for a few more questions, I think. Um, one mm -hmm. is, can you give more detail about which corporations are co-opting the term permaculture? Oh, ah. Okay, uh, I just use it as an no by now of any corporation co-opting. We need to be aware. I just use it as, as an extreme example. Yeah, well, I think the, the co-optation that's going on it, it is, is so, uh, yeah, it's, it's talking about ecology, about diversity. So in effect, whether they use the term permaculture or not, they are co-opting everything that permaculture stands for. Because permaculture just stand exactly for diversified system. And that is anathema to a system that is about extracting wealth. Extracting wealth from the many for the benefit of the few. And remember, uh, now we're talking about the few. You must have heard the recent statistic from Oxfam that 62 individuals own more wealth than half of the global population. And so, you know, we, we are getting to the point where we are stupid. The majority is stupid if we allow this system to continue to destroy our, not just our planet, not just our identity, but everything we care about, including an ability to survive. I mean, people's livelihoods are being threatened they're being told now, <clears throat> don't think that you can have a, a job for a lifetime. You've got to be willing to keep educating yourself and changing. You've got to be willing to totally transform your life. You've got to be willing to travel here, there, and everywhere just to pay for a room and board, just to pay for the food on the table and a roof over your head. I, 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 uh, I want to add quickly without, uh, you know, I, we're focusing on climate change, but I just do want to add that our experience is that this economic system, by robbing particularly men of their self-respect through this top-down, homogenous consumer identity that threatens self-respect, uh, and in non-Western cultures, you know, if you have dark skin, if you're Muslim, if you're you know, anything but the archetypical blue-eyed, blonde Westerner, then you are nobody. At the same time, that system that destroys identity and self-esteem is destroying the ability to provide for yourself and your family. This is a recipe for violence. It's a recipe for fundamentalism. It's a recipe for local friction and competition. It's a recipe for terrorism. So. Here we are, you know, looking at how this system destroys everything we care about, 
So systemic change is the way forward. And please be aware that in order to really build systems that adapt to the living world, adapt to the diversity of genuine human individualism, genuine cultural diversity, we must move in the direction of more human scale, localized economies. So in terms of action, uh, this, is, this is the way forward, is to spread the word, resist the further globalization, which is the further corporatization of our world. Do that by spreading the word. You can do it in so many different ways. You can uh, use music if you, if you know how to sing. And you can use theater, you can use poetry. You can use more conventional ways of letter writing, of sending out emails to your network. Alert them to the websites, to the individuals, to the alternative media that are covering these issues. Make information and vision and activism. This is what I call big picture activism. And remember that part of that big picture activism is not only the resistance, it's the renewal. Let people know about those positive things that are happening. And one of the things that's happening is that a lot of the left, the political left, that was very anti-spirituality, is beginning to change, to recognize what Camilla was saying, to recognize the importance of experiencing that deep connection to life, of realizing and experiencing what happens when we quiet the intellectual mind, when we allow ourselves to feel that deep connection, to experience the sacredness, the beauty and the joy of life. Uh, this, uh, this waking up within the political movements to the sacred, to the spiritual, is happening. It's a very important development, equally important. People who previously practice a sort of new age spiritual path of only, essentially the message was there'll only be peace in the world if I have inner peace. It ended up being a very personal and often, uh, often narcissistic pursuit of only me and my navel and my meditation, my practice. People who were pursuing that path are also waking up to the need for political change, to the need for action, the need to realize that the wholeness of things means that there is no inner without the outer. There is no personal without the cosmic and the global. It is all interdependent. So activism can also include building right now local food systems where you live. This is a foundation of a healthy economy. It's a foundation of the real productivity we talked about earlier. So I think <clears throat> right now, anything you can do where you live to start rebuilding local diversified food systems, you know you've done something positive. If you don't have the energy to deal with this climate analysis or the global trade treaties, as long as you are really helping to build local food systems and doing that with a concern for the broader community and the environment, you will be doing something positive. But I would ask people to please give maybe 10% of their time to supporting the resistance movements. The idea that we would encourage is that it's 50-50. So much, Helena. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we only have five minutes left in the official webinar time, so we can't get to all of the wonderful comments that have been coming up in the chat. But uh, I think we have time to discuss one more thing before we have to call it a day. Um, one of the later comments in the chat uh, mentions carbon fee and dividend again. Um, and that one of the reasons that it's, it could be a good idea is because it introduces the idea of charging for externalities. And once we do that for fossil fuels, it would 
it might be possible to consider it for other things too. Um, I don't know if you oh, want to no. comment on that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, this is the core of our critique on the financialization of nature. They use this uh, argument that we need to charge for externalities because it's important to create a market for biodiversity offsets for water and for carbon. So first you need to convince people that are something external to the process of production, that is the environmental destruction, but it's also life destruction, and this can be, you can pay for that. So you cannot separate, and this is important because this is a core issue, the idea of carbon, be it tax, dividend, fee, or credits, you know, from the very idea that we are accepting now a new property rights, the creation, I mean, this is historically, you know, property over something that is intangible. You can own carbon, you don't need to own the land. But especially because you are enclosing, enclosing, you know, uh, and creating a whole portfolio of environmental services that are only uh, workable if you generate the right to pollute. I can only sell biodiversity offsets. If I assume that diversity destruction is part of the development game, I can only sell carbon credits if I accept that some countries can give to different business the, uh, their quota of destruction. But this, there is extensive literature, you know, and critique that has been built over the last 10 years saying don't fall in this trap, you know, we cannot, this is what the World Bank is selling. Our agenda cannot be the same as the World Bank, I'm sorry. We know very well this actor and what it has done to the world over the last decades. So uh, if I may uh, just add a couple of um, comments in this final minute, is that I think very sad how, for example, Hollywood has helped to shape an imaginary of this catastrophe climate change, you know, the sea levels rising and everything falling apart. And people are actually living their existence now, their only life that they have in despair, in, in fear. And fear is what the system wants. They don't know how to deal with joy, with hope, with enthusiasm. Even you can fight with joy, and it's important because once you are afraid, once you are terrified, you are more prone to accept the market-based salvation for your soul. You are only going to buy the so-called new indulgences. No? If you are a consumer that are very worried that you, know, you are going to burn in hell if you don't uh, fight correctly climate change, and this is what the market wants. We need to fight with different uh, strategies. And our strategies is to build this energy that is positive, that believes unconditionally in life and the beauty of that we are all here together and we have this immense amount of knowledge that has been um, received by us, inherited by us from our ancestors, from many different cultures all over the world. And I think this is a fundamental aspect that we need to keep. We need to fight and to resist in this renewal process, but this has to be led with joy, not with despair, not with depression, not with catastrophic scenarios. And I would also just like to quickly add that really any market solution in the global market, which is now dominated by giant multinationals who have this huge pocketbook, huge pocketbook. Remember that those trillions, actually trillions of dollars being created by banks through these financial instruments, those quadrillion are working with the giant monopolies. So any market solution is going to be wonderful for those who have quadrillions and very bad for those who have very little money or no money. So really market solutions in today's global market are simply not going to solve the problem. We need rules. 
we need to bring back rules. We need to start looking at in terms of the political dimension. We are talking about governments coming together because civic society is insisting on international collaboration to take back real democratic power. And that means curtailing the power and the movement of global capital and corporations. It means that we have to start a, a strategy whereby nations come together to together to take on the power of the interesting banks and corporations. This will only happen with civic society insisting on this. But we need to use the nation state, our representative, to come together. We need to use that mechanism to remove the power of the mobile uh, multinational corporations. That doesn't mean increasing the power of the nation state vis-a-vis -vis local communities. Actually, vis-a-vis -vis local communities and regions, we should be decentralizing power. But we mustn't confuse the two. We mustn't go only into decentralization. We actually need to strengthen international collaboration in order to reduce and ultimately break up these interlinked monopolies. The first step is to say no to further freedom for those corporations, which is through the trade treaty. The next step is to decrease start that process of bringing the economy back under democratic surveillance at every level and always using the subsidiarity doing things at the most local level possible. That's the goal, but it's not going to happen. Uh, so we, we, uh, we feel that we have a very clear analysis of strategies that can take us forward. I hope that those of you who are listening will look at our future webinars, will look at our website, Local Futures. We are also happy that we now have uh, over, um, we have 110,000 people on our Economics of Happiness Facebook page. Uh, so I very much hope people will look at that and do anything you can also to support us because we, as with all groups that are critiquing this system, we have very little financial support for this. Uh, so any anything you can do to help support this effort to get out the broader analysis will be very, very helpful. And remember, as uh, Camilla was saying, that joy, hope, that's the energy that we need to maintain our well-being, the energy we need to have an activism, to have the energy and the courage to question this bigger system. Thank you all so much for listening, and thank you, Camilla for your work and for joining in. Thank you. And I, I'm uh, so happy that you're part of the IAL and we'll continue with our international alliance <laughs> for localization to build up a bigger movement. Thank you. Great. I'd like to thank both of you for a really stimulating webinar and of course all of the attendees for participating and asking such great questions. So we will send out an email soon with a link to a short survey about the webinar experience. Um, soon after that, we will send all of you an email with a recording of this webinar and an announcement of our future webinars. And thanks again for participating. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.